Hey everybody, welcome to Colin Podcast about real estate, show number five. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Greg Emmer from Equity Max. And Greg and his family firm are what you might call private or hard money lenders, and they've been in the business for 30 plus years. So a lot of time, a lot of different cycles in the real estate market, and they have some fantastic insights about the market. It's the kind of short-term lending side of things is one that's often a little bit misunderstood. Many listeners will just be familiar with the typical conventional 80% loans. But the short term, the hard money loans are actually a vital part of the industry and and a vital kind of cog in the wheel that that keeps this big machine rolling and rolling and rolling. Uh, We also talk about a lot of different uses for hard money loans that you might not have thought of and the good places to use it, the bad ways to use it. We talk about the types of properties Greg lends on, the ones he stays away from, Uh, his typical customer. He talks us through a really interesting uh, typical deal that he did in Hollywood, Florida recently, Uh, the current hard money rates and fees. Uh, We talk in a bit of detail about how the last recession, the 2008 recession, affected his business and how they had more than 240 loans outstanding that they had to take back and effectively transition their business into being a property manager for several years. That's a fascinating story. And we just talk about how listeners in general can learn a little bit better how to network with the right kinds of people, how to meet lenders like Greg and meet other people that can help you get started and accelerate your real estate journey. So it's a really interesting conversation. I I hope you enjoy it. And let's head on over and see what Greg has to say. Hey, Greg, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. Thank you, Colin. Thanks for having me. Hope you're doing well. I am. I am. I'm I'm doing fine despite all the craziness we've endured these trials three months and I, I know you've had your your share of um busy days and nights as well right mm-hmm. has it been that bad <laughs> oh well yeah, I, can't, I can't complain uh, it's, a different, it, it's a different world out there for sure both uh, personally and professionally but uh you know just trying to make it through day by day right that's it well you've been in this game for a while you you, you work in i think like a family business that's been around for 30 years so you've seen your fair share of ups and downs you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and your business sure so we are like you said a family business my father it's called equity max um we're a licensed lender in florida we do the uh lend around the country my father started the business back in 1990. He's still very much active in it. Um, I've helped him expand the business uh, from just South Florida, where our home office is, uh, to around the country. So, um, you know, being around 30 years gives you experience. It um, uh, potentially gives you indications of, of when to ramp up your loan portfolio, um, when to ramp up your investing, when to, to slow down your investing. Um, we only use our own money, so you're not getting a lot of, of red tape that you get and can sometimes find with other hard money lenders or even private money lenders. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we, we think we're a good option for, you know, new investors, seasoned investors. Um, and, uh, you know, we welcome the opportunity to work with anyone, including yourself. That's it. Well, look, I, I love that you use your own money. That, you know, that, that gives you a lot of flexibility when, when times get tough, when you're using other people's money within your business, you can be under pressure to meet certain quarterly targets or to expand into certain areas that you might not want to. So kind of using your own money as kind of a get rich, slow scheme. I really like that. I, I take that kind of approach myself. Um, you know, I think you're basically a specialist in, in, in short term lending, which I think a lot of people that aren't involved in it don't know that much about. Can you talk to us a little bit about the role uh, you know, private and hard money lenders play in the real estate industry? Sure. So just to differentiate between a hard money and a private money lender, and I'll kind of backtrack back to when our company started. I wasn't around then, but I, I have had several conversations with people that were around then. And basically pretty much everyone back then was a private money and or hard money lender. They were one and the same. Okay. Then the recession happened in 2008. And as we recovered, you started seeing these national institutionally backed lenders come into the woodwork and they aren't private. They use institutional money, you know, Wall Street money. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of where the differentiation between private money and hard money lenders, uh, uh, you know, separated. You also think of hard money lenders being able to do a lot more volume um, and private money lenders really doing smaller, you know, local deals. They go drive to the 
cry right now and have always played is just giving investors the ability to purchase properties or refi properties really quickly with the intent that the borrower will pay them off fairly quickly as well because they are generally low qualification requirements but a very high interest rate that something can be something that can be used purposefully if it's a short-term loan and it's not kept longer than let's say 12 months. Yeah, okay, so we're talking about higher interest, shorter term loans. So what 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 kind of fees are, you know, hard money lenders, private money lenders, you know, charging these days for people that are used to getting sure. a fixed interest rate of 4% or 4.5% what the people that borrow money for 3, 6, 9, 12 months, you know, generally pay? Sure. And let me just preface, if I end up moving the screen around, it's just, uh, you know, if I talk, I just want to make sure that people can see my face. Uh, generally, you'll, you'll find that the typical hard money loan, the term is 12 months. OK, so you can keep it up to a year. Generally, we find that our loans are kept anywhere from four to eight months. Mm -hmm. So most people don't keep it less than four, but a lot don't actually get to, you know, the full 12 month maturity mark uh, rates. You know, I'll give you context. Back before uh, this COVID situation happened, rates were very much in the high single digits, you know, hovering around 10%, give or take. Mm -hmm. uh, that was amongst private money and hard money lenders. So, you know, the smaller lenders and the large national lenders. Okay. okay. Uh, when COVID happened, all the national lenders uh, couldn't get backing from Wall Street because Wall Street was freaking out at what was going on around the world. So they suspended operations. Um, and uh, you know, they've since come back, but hard money lenders, the large guys and private money lenders alike have slowly increased their interest rate to, you know, instead of capping at 10 percent, they're anywhere from 10 to 12 percent. So 10 percent is really the floor mm -hmm. and it could even be higher in a lot of cases. Same thing with the loan to values, obviously the percent that a lender large or small will lend against. Um, you know, three months ago, people were, it was easy to get 90% financing. Now, uh, investors are, are lucky to get 75 to 80% financing uh, with the cap at 65 to 70% LTV as opposed to 70 to 75% LTV. So um, do I think we'll slowly uh, uh, get back to normal and these pre-COVID uh, uh, underwriting terms? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the meantime, we've kind of regressed in a, in a sense to, you know, I'd say the terms are similar to how they were maybe in 2000, you know, 16 and 17. We've really oh, okay. gone that far back. I don't think it's going to be three years till they get back to normal, but, you know, that's, that's how far we've regressed it in terms of what, what lenders are offering. Okay. And so just so that our listeners are clear, I think the main types of people that use these loans are, are guys that are adding some sort of value to the real estate, people that are going to buy it and, and sell it within, you know, ideally the quicker, the better within three months, six months, nine months, that could be wholesalers. It could be fix and flippers, you know, like I've been for a long time where it makes sense to borrow money at a 10% interest rate because it, it enables you to do a higher volume of deals that that you might not have otherwise been able yeah. to do with your I own mean, money. Let's, let's take context. Yeah, let's take context, for instance, uh, of a hundred thousand dollar loan. Mm -hmm. OK, um, the bank, let's say we'll give you five percent. Let's say a hard money lender will give you 10 percent. By the way, for purposes of our conversation, I'll call hard money and private money just hard money lenders. They're, you know, consider mm -hmm. them to be interchangeable for purposes of our conversation. But let's say you take a hundred thousand dollar loan say the bank that's requiring every qualification in the book is going to give you 5%. And let's say you go to equity max or hard money, you know, lender X, and they'll give you 10%. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a difference of 5%. Okay. Over the course of a full year in terms of interest rate. Now that's $5,000 over a 12 month term. Okay. On a hundred thousand dollar loan. Um, let's say like on average, you keep the loan six months. You're talking about a difference of going to your bank and risking losing the deal because they take too long, going with a hard money loan, this difference of $2,500, yep. okay? Now, if somebody is so adamant about our interest rate, I'm going to say, if you are so worried about $2,500, maybe it's not a right, the right deal because the whole point is you're willing, you know, the opportunity cost is not the $2,500 difference. It's the difference of not being able to get the property. Yeah. And if 
you stand, to your point, if you stand thirty, forty thousand dollars on the short term flip, what's twenty five hundred dollars? It's less than, you know, ten percent of your margin. I agree. If you're flipping a property and the numbers don't make sense when you add in a twenty-five or thirty-five hundred dollar hard money fee, you probably shouldn't be doing that deal. It's not a good enough deal for you to be doing. You know, you need to allow for those kinds of overheads. You need to allow for those kinds of expenses, and that that goes for pretty much anybody. Nobody reaches any kind of scale, and by scale, I mean you know more than two deals a month. If you're doing five, ten, fifteen, twenty deals a month. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are. You're 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 borrowing money to do it. Nobody's just using their own For fifty sure. million dollars to to do all these deals. You know, we didn't actually scale properly ourselves until we took that seriously and started borrowing money. You know, four or five years ago. And so, what there's there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. I mean, what can you give us an example of what's a good use of of hard money and what's a bad use of hard money? Yeah, I'll, sure. Um, I, I also want to stress, um, you know, that, um, you know, being a prolific investor is, is all relative. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, our core market um, as lenders is is to deal with the people that have full time jobs that, you know, watch HGTV at night and see the property brothers and want to do their first flip or second flip or, you know, maybe have done five flips total. We don't generally deal with the prolific investor. We do have some, but we, we really do cater to people that um, you know, uh, that maybe are not on the scale that you are because you do quite a bit, but there's no right or wrong. There are lenders that deal with uh, high volume lenders and we can as well. But, uh, uh, you know, I just want to stress that um, just because you maybe do two deals a month versus 10 deals a month, that doesn't uh, make you any less successful. Sure. Uh, I'd say the scaling is important if maybe your margins are a little thinner mm -hmm. and you know, you're, you're running those margins across multiple deals. Cause you know, nobody wants to work their tail off for $10,000 profit, you know, once a month on one deal. It's just obviously that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Um, but getting back to your quiet money deal and a bad hard money deal. Uh, a good hard money deal is something that I think, or, or, or a property that you're buying at least, I say, 60 cents on the dollar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, I, I think even real estate gurus say you want to be 70%, but after everything, and I think that's good. I'd say maybe 60% uh, is a little bit more conservative, but at the end of the day, you account for cost overruns, which always happen. You can account for potential market fluctuations or changes in, in market conditions like we're experiencing right now. Mm -hmm. So I think if let's say you you have a hundred thousand dollar property you can get it for you can be all in for 60 maybe let's say 60 to 70 thousand that's a good deal. Yeah. Um, knowing that the work that needs to be done plus marketing time plus sale time will all take place in less than a year that's a good deal. Um, you know six months, you know, that's, that is cause for concern for me because it's not just the rehab. It's going to take getting materials lined up, your contractors lined up, potentially applying for permits. Then on the flip side, you got to market the property and you can't just, you know, go on the MLS and put a half a million dollar property. You may need to do some more extensive marketing mm -hmm. and market right now for half a million dollar homes is not as much as it is for quarter million dollar homes, let's say. Yep. Plus, always, whether it's a small purchase or a large purchase, you always have to account, well, how's my buyer buying it? And if they're getting bank financing, you know, that could tack on an extra 30 to 45 days onto the amount of time that you keep the loan. So all these things that you should consider uh, is what makes a deal a good deal or a bad deal. But again, uh, running the numbers, if you keep a hard money loan at a double digit interest rate for less than 12 months, you're in a good position. Um, you know, real estate lenders like us are not in a position to, uh, you know, charge you as much as we can for as long as we can. Because at the end of the day, we're just lenders. We don't want to take the property back if you fail. We want to give you money and get our money back. We're yeah. not in the property management business or the flipping business. So at the end of the day, we're going to give you terms that we think um, make it optimal for you to pay us back. And what we find is that if it's any longer than 12 months, you're, you're really paying too much and it puts you at, at higher risk for default.
Yeah, and presumably you you want people to pay it back in four or five or six months. You don't want to be waiting eleven months because you Absolutely. you have you have fees in there, you know, origination fees, loan fees, admin fees, whatever you want to call them, and and they'll I guess presumably increase the longer you hold on to it as well. So you want to get your money back so you can lend it back out again. You don't want to be prodding somebody, asking them how they're getting on and hearing nightmare stories about how they had to, you know, rewire a house that wasn't in the renovation budget. Or you just, you want them to get the deal done, yeah. get out with a profit and, and borrow from you again. Absolutely. We love repeat customers. Any lender does. Okay. So like these, this, these hard money, short-term loans are, are for people that are, you know, doing a real estate investment. They're getting in, they're getting out. You don't use hard money as a way to, you know, pay off all their debt. You're not using hard money on your primary residence. This is for real estate deal making, you know, getting into a house at 70 sure. cents on the dollar, putting a bunch of money in and getting out at 100 cents on the dollar. And, and your your hard money yeah. fees are no different than your, your insurance and your renovation costs. It's just another cost on your spreadsheet. There, there are several ways, Colin, there are several ways to utilize hard money. Here's another, uh, mm -hmm. here's another example. Um, instead of buying a property, let's say, let's say you see a property on the market. Let's say it's a great rental. Okay. And hard money lenders, remember 12 month term, you're not really looking at them as a long-term solution, but let's say you see this great rental. Let's say you're even buying it at, you know, 85 cents on the dollar. So there is a bit of equity there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the hard money is just, you know, we're going to lend at 60 to 70 percent and you're going to end up having to bring too much money down that you don't have. But if you do have another rental, let's say it's free and clear. OK, or let's say it has a very small mortgage balance. But what we found is that people that bought rentals during the Great Recession bought them for pennies on the dollar and they've now appreciated, you know, 100 to 200 percent we can cash you out of that and give you about 60% of that value. And that's essentially uh, a line of credit, not a line of credit. We give you all the money and then you can use that to purchase that rental property with additional funds that you otherwise did not have. Now then let's think about it. What's the exit strategy to get out of our hard money loan, which is a rental you use, uh, you, you then go to the bank and then you, you apply for long-term financing. Okay. Uh, on both the properties mm -hmm. or just one of them. And, and now you have a portfolio loan of two properties at a very low interest rate. And again, because you were able to utilize hard money, now you have two rentals that are making you more net cash than if you just had one rental that was free and clear, even though you have now have a mortgage on both properties. It's all about properly, as you said, properly using leverage and so long as the net figure is higher and you're able to manage debt properly, it's a it's it's a winning situation. Yeah, I agree. It's it's a perfect if you have a yeah, if you need that money for six months, 12 months, and then you have another exit that's a long term loan or some other cash out or some other sale, then it, yeah, it can make a lot of sense. It doesn't just have to be for fix and flips. You're right that people can use that as a type of bridge financing to expand their, their rental portfolio. I think that's great. So. So tell us what yeah. types of properties do you lend on and what types of properties do you stay away from? Like, do you stay away from, you know, retail and offices, for example, do you only do single family and multifamily? What's your, what's your kind of product line? Um, I'd say anything that's meant to be, be a dwelling, i.e. something that you can live in is, is really our bread and butter. It could be a condo, a town home. It could be preferably a single family home. We don't do mobile or modular homes. We find that a lot of lenders, including us, don't do them. We generally don't do vacant land, uh, but we'll do commercial multifamily, which is considered five units or higher. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't do business. We stay away from business-specific loans, i.e., a commercial property that's being used as a daycare center, as a restaurant, as a convenience store. Something that, if we took back, it would have a very specific use. Um, and we'd have to run it like a business. Whereas if it's a rental property, you're running it as a landlord and it's more aligned with, you know, our, our, our way of operation and our way of running our business. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can you talk us through a recent typical customer and a, and, and a typical deal that you did? Yeah, sure. Um, there was, I mean, you know, our volumes anywhere from, 20 to 30 deals a month right now during COVID, it's been a little bit slower i'd say on the lower end of normal so we're in the low 20s but okay. typical deal is um let's see here's a deal here's a deal uh that we just did it's a deal in hollywood florida mm -hmm. um buyer was paying 250 for it 
okay? Uh, we lent 200 on it, so I think we lent a, a little over. We were at about at 207, so it's about an 83% loan to purchase price financing. And comp showed that this property was at 350. So we are, I think, uh, based on our loan to total after repair value, we're at a 59% loan to after repair value. Okay. So uh, borrower is bringing his own rehab money because it's not a heavy rehab job. Um, and you know, if he buys this for uh, 250, mm -hmm. puts 30 into it, he's at 280. Let's say our closing costs, commissions, he has to pay on the back end. Uh, um, and uh, you know fees involved with the hard money loan title costs that are let's say he's up to two hundred. Uh, he is now at potentially a fifty thousand dollar profit if he sells it for three fifty. Yeah. Um, you know he's into it for three hundred. Mm -hmm. Did I say two hundred? I don't know, but he's into it for three hundred. He makes fifty thousand dollars on this property. And what was his exposure? If if he's into it for three hundred and we lent him about two hundred, that means his total cash outlay was a hundred thousand. Yeah. So. He's making fifty thousand on a hundred thousand. That's a fifty percent cash on cash return. Colin, I have a very easy question for you. Would you take fifty percent cash on cash return? Yes, sir, I would. <laughs> so that's. I think you can really, uh, you know, push through. That's where leverage helps you. If you were not using a hard money loan, there, you would then. It would then. You'd need three hundred thousand cash or two hundred eighty thousand cash to do it, which is a whole other exactly. thing. Exactly. Exactly. And your your net return would just be so much smaller. Yeah. You know, would it be worth it? Who knows? No, I think that's a great example of a win win. The 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 kind of rehabber gets a fifty thousand dollar profit on a hundred thousand dollar investment because he borrowed the other two hundred from you. You're you're lending two hundred on on a property that's worth three fifty fixed up and maybe even without it being fixed up, it's still worth yeah. you know, two two seventy or two eighty or three hundred. So you've got plenty of of equity to protect you in there as well but obviously you you don't want to be dealing with that but if you have to it's you, you'll recoup your money and probably more after doing some extra work and legal fees and everything else but it's a win-win situation and uh yeah that, that's a good example of of uh, the right way to use a hard money loan and that sounds like a very nice deal in, in mm -hmm. hollywood so talk to us briefly yeah. uh greg about how the last recession the 2008 recession affected your business because presumably sure. there were a bunch of rehabbers caught out that had borrowed money to sell something for 350 within six months. And then when those six months appeared, it was suddenly not worth 350 anymore and they might not have been able to sell it. I mean, did you, mm -hmm. was that, presumably that was a pretty difficult time for, for everybody, yeah. for, for rehabbers. I mean, I was, I was in the market. It was a difficult time for me, but I, I haven't really spoken to any lenders about how it affected their business and how mm -hmm. did you deal with the loans you had outstanding when, you know, the rug just got yeah, sure. swept from under everybody's feet. Sure. Yeah. So let's just, you know, let me give you some examples of, uh, you know, typical loans um, and why we were, and we still, st we stayed in business throughout the great recession. Let me, and I'll tell you why versus uh, other lenders out there that went under. Um, you know, let's take an example of the same house that instead of lending uh, on 250, we instead of lending 200, let's say we lent 250. Mm -hmm. Okay, because that's where we were. Every, you know, it was so competitive. People were leaving closing table, the closing table with checks in hand. Right. Uh, the borrowers. Were. Yeah. Um, so you know, if the property that you put zero money into, or let's say 10 to 20,000, instead of being worth 350, is now worth let's say 175, I mean, prices drop that much, you are now underwater on your property. What What is your financial incentive if, you know, you're reading the news and you're watching the news, knowing that markets aren't going to rebound quickly, what is your incentive to putting your money, your sweat, your sweat equity too, into this property if you're not going to make anything? So uh, plain and simple, borrowers bolted, you know, and we were left with about 200 to 250 foreclosures. Um, now, which is a lot. That is a hell of a lot. Um, and we took back the pro we took back the properties. We rented them out, and we were able to make uh, uh, get cash flow on that till the market rebounded. We seller financed and sold some of them, but ultimately the ones we couldn't, we we sold off as the market rebounded. Now, what protected us, or what allowed us to you know stay in business? Um, if we were charging twelve percent and we were getting zero. Um, you know, and we had nothing to pay back. We're still at a net zero. We're just not 
we're just not revenue positive, let's say. Yeah. Okay. But let's say you're another hard money lender that's using bank facilities or using outside money to finance their transactions. And let's say they're paying 6%. If you're getting zero and you have to pay 6%, you're in, in the negative 6%. And it, it just became too burdensome for these these lenders to, to, to pay. And they just, they ran out of money. I mean, that's as simple as that. So, you know, we are in a position where while we weren't making anything or weren't making as much, we weren't having to pay back anyone. Um, and it was definitely lean times as, as I call it with my father. But, uh, yep. uh, you know, the fact that we weren't laden with any debt, um, allowed us to stay in business to, to whatever revenue we had we you know we we you know funneled it back into the business and we were still actively lending too certainly there weren't as many deals uh financed back then as there are now um but where there were we were financing and uh it's not like there wasn't a fair share of reos and sales going on the fact is is volumes were down because the banks weren't lending on the back end you know, credit had completely dried up. So if an investor bought a property in 2009, he couldn't sell it to an end user for a few years because the banks weren't lending to that end user. Yep. And that's why that when we, we, we finance borrowers on purchases, we had to do it on a rental basis. And we had to make sure that whatever they were getting in rents could, could uh, help them afford a mortgage payment. Wow, that's amazing. So you had like more than 200 properties with loans on them and, and people couldn't pay back those loans. So you had to take those properties back through yeah. foreclosure, presumably, yeah. which is very expensive and time consuming. And then you had to make I'm sweating just thinking about it. And then you had to get them, <laughs> you had to make them rent ready, because I'm sure in a lot of cases they were not rent ready. So you had to get them rent ready, which costs more money. And then you had to deal with property managers to rent them out, which wasn't your business. Your business was lending money. People. I I know. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, listen, for all intents and purposes, Colin, for maybe a three to four year stretch, uh, we were we were essentially property yeah. managers. You know, we, we had a couple property managers. We filled in the gaps where we could, uh, you know, but that was a predominant amount of our business damage control. Mm -hmm. I mean, just waiting for the credit markets to rebound, the markets to rebound so that we can get back to lending. And it took it took three to four years for that to happen. Yeah. I remember just. So, you know, not that my father is any sort of a uh, Notre Dame or sage, but, you know, when the market first collapsed, he's like, man, I don't see this, you know, fully recovering until about 2014. I was thinking to myself, six years, six, what are you going to do? Is, six years is such a long time. Yep. Um, and, and that's about how long it took, six years for the market to recover. It, it did. And, and you're right that if, if you hadn't have been using your own money, you, you most likely would have gone bankrupt like so many others did. Because if you're normally receiving $300,000 in interest a month and, you know, goes to zero, I mean, I guess you can survive that if, but if you have to pay someone else 150,000 a month because you're borrowing from them, you've an arbitrage, you're borrowing at six to lend at 12. I mean, how, how long are you going to keep paying 150,000 a month in interest with nothing coming in? You're going to go out of business within a couple of months and the next guy up the ladder is going to take all the property. So the fact that you've, like you, like you say, you have that get rich slow kind of scheme and you're using your family money, you're, you're able to, I mean, you still have to bust your ass obviously to, to get through it, but you're able to, to survive. And, and presumably, you know, once you own those properties for four or five years and, and got them rented out, you, you probably made, probably had a lot of equity in them and, and, and got, you know, got a decent amount of money out of it after all the work. Yeah, I mean, uh, some of them were losers, you know, where we lost money on. Some of them we definitely uh, made some money on. Um, but, you know, uh, at the end of the day, any property that we uh, – a 12% rate on a hard money loan, our rate of return is very high. It's very hard to make that on a rental – not as easy to make that on a rental investment. So, yeah, we were making – we were, you know, we were earning revenue, just not at the clip that you would uh, with the typical hard money loan rate of return. Yeah, no, I was more referring to when you, you finally got around to, to selling them on the open market, that you, you would have re yeah, recovered yeah. more um, than your original you know, principal. Yes, but at the end of the day, you have to, um, you know, all things considered, remember, foreclosure costs, potentially eviction costs, yep. repairs, all the costs considered, you know, profits weren't that big, but 
they were there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, look, I, it's it's not something you would you would recommend. It's not a it's not, it's not a fun way to spend your time. It was, it's it was... not the it's not the business. It's just not the you know it's just not the yeah. business we're in. That's all. Um, you know, if we were a hugely prolific company, then um, I'm sure we would have a side gig where we did do that, and it would be fine if you know if we were in the preservation business and had rentals until we could sell. Yeah. But you know, it just. I mean, people because, forget uh, that happened to every kind of lender. I mean, J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo didn't want to be owning hundreds of thousands of properties either uh, and dealing with them, but they did. And, and they just got on with it and, and they had to invent whole new business models to, to manage it. But look, we're in a totally different, that seems like a, a lifetime ago, like that, whatever, 11, 12 years ago. It wasn't that long ago, really, but we're in a very different situation now. You know, the economy is is in recession, but it's not a real estate driven recession it wasn't caused by reckless lending and and subprime mortgages or anything like that at all the the qualifications standards of the mortgages are way higher now and the equity was way higher every every crisis is is different they just come up and get you and they're a bit different i mean what's your take on how covid is is going to shake up the the real estate industry you know it's a bit of a lagging indicator it hasn't caused that much craziness in in my you know middle class single family homes yet i mean what's What's your take on how it's it's going to impact? You're you're in the kind of closer to the Miami region, which is a little bit worse affected than Tampa, probably real estate wise. So, what's your tell me your opinion um, on where we're going with this? You know, I just think everything's slower. You got to understand when when COVID happened and the stock market just absolutely plummeted. Everyone was like, "Up, oh, it's a great recession again." But um, and and I was in that same boat. Um, but the fact is, is that you know, it nothing bad is. Ha nothing dramatically bad has happened just yet. I think if anything, transaction volume on both the sales side and buy side are down. Mm -hmm. People don't want to leave their homes for whatever reason, or they're minimizing that. Also, during the Great Recession, I mean, the banking and finance infrastructure was what was being hit head on, head on, and yep. it took them, you know, several months to find a solution to to rectify that. Uh, with the Federal Reserve and pumping money into the credit markets. What the Treasury Secretary did with the COVID situation uh, immediately was saying was was what took them, you know, several months in response to the Great Recession. And that's why I think uh, there's, you know, there's been that buffer that has potentially prevented the market from collapsing to the extent that it did during the Great Recession. Uh, it's a so you know to recap, it's a twofold answer. It's one you know our market wasn't the primary uh, uh, wasn't the primary hit, if you will, yep. of what was going on. And two, um, you know the Federal Reserve and the government took more immediate action than they did last time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are we bound for something like the Great Recession? I think the only answer to that is maybe or I don't know. Um, I can't say one way or another. Does it look like it? Probably not. Uh, but you know, I'm 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 not a I'm not a you know I, I don't have all the answers. Um, I, I'd say I'd say it's trending more likely not. But I, I just think for the time being, everything's just going to be slower. Everyone's yeah. just moving at a lot slower pace. Um, uh, so you know, our number is going to dip. Um, sure, but it's not a result of of an absolute like free fall, for instance. No, I certainly don't see any any free fall happening, which. You know, because you had severe liquidity problems in in the banking system, they needed money. They, they did whatever they needed to do to get money. They'll they'll take your house and sell exactly. it for thirty cents on the dollar just to get whatever they can to keep the lights on. It's a totally different situation now. There's this huge tidal wave of of government money propping up asset prices everywhere, every kind of asset, including real estate. And and um, yeah, I I don't know. I I don't know what the summer is is going to bring. Things are getting a little a little weird again in the you know, with, with, with COVID cases going up. But like you say, asset prices are, are solid. People are still renting houses. People are still buying houses. You know, flippers and rehabbers are probably I doing bought, less I volumes. Uh, I bought a house. I bought an REO. Um, and, uh, you know, if markets drop in the coming couple quarters, I, I was speaking with a few colleagues about and I think we're going to have a lot more clarity before the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, it's an election year also. So that's really going to, I think, going to be a driving factor into the confidence that's instilled in the real estate market. Um, yep. And I, I bought a home. It was an REO and, you know, it remains to be seen whether it was a good deal. I mean, 
what I bought it for now continue to drop, then, you know, it's not a good deal. But I think any investor, whether, you know, they're a seasoned investor like you, or they're watching or listening to this and they're thinking of investing, markets will always rebound, will always rebound. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just about setting yourself up for weather, being able to weather that storm and being able to take advantage of a situation where you could potentially profit. Yeah. Um, and that's what it's all about. It is. And there's also a big difference between, you know, buying a house now that you're planning to sell in six months and there's a little bit of uncertainty there or just buying a house that you intend either to live in as a primary residence or that you intend to keep as a long term rental, because if it's a primary or a long term rental, you shouldn't be too worried if they dip by 5% or 10% or even mm -hmm. more, because like you say, that real estate is always cyclical. You're not you're not buying it because of how it affects your asset column every month. You're buying it for the long term rental income. Mm -hmm. you're, you're buying it for the, you know, the equity pay down, the tax advantages, a whole other reasons. You're, you're not buying it for the quarterly mm -hmm. cycles. You, you, the privilege and the, the lucky of, of being a passive investor and owning rental properties is that you can kind of sleep a little bit more soundly at night and you're not sweating all that stuff the way a rehabber or a wholesaler might be sweating it. You're not, you're not in yeah, it for the short game. Um, yeah. Uh, to that point though, I will, will say that, you know, each economic downturn quote unquote situation is different because, you know, I, I haven't spoken with uh, a lot of buy and hold landlords, but I'm curious how they're holding up with, you know, all the unemployment that's going on in our country and all these, you know, lower class and middle class jobs, uh, if, if they're, you know, uh, if they're able to afford their rent, um, you know, it's, listen, it's a tough time out there. And if they can't afford their rent, then that landlord may be not be able to afford their mortgage payment on their primary. So, you know, it's a trickle, it's a trickle up effect, I guess you could say. And, yep. Um, you know, I, I, I think it varies a lot. I mean, it's, you know, I personally, I own rentals in, in, in Tampa, I have rentals in uh, Alabama, in, in Ohio, and they're mostly kind of lower middle class properties. And, you know, rent collections have been ultra solid. They, they've been as good, if not better than the same quarter last year. They've been really, really good. I mean, part of that might be because real estate's a lagging indicator and, and part of it is you know you don't lose your job in april and then stop paying your rent in may necessarily because you know you, you still need to keep yeah, the house the, the ppp you know all that's there yeah, and the ppp um and i, yeah, I haven't I mean, had high know, have... exposure to the service sector either I, i'm don't i'm not renting people to people that are working in restaurants and and bars and hotels and, and airports or anything like that that's just kind of dumb look that uh, yeah. there happen to be a lot of other types of jobs and military and I mean, nurses. I, and... I remember, I remember, I remember this Colin, um, you know, back in 08, uh, uh, you first saw signs of a, a potential market dip and it didn't reach full steam until the end of the year until about six months later. Mm -hmm. um, so to that point, again, it goes back to what I was saying and what you agreed with is that, We'll have some more clarity, um, you know, towards November, December. I mean, we'll have so much consumer data on spending, you know, yep. with the holidays around that time. Uh, certainly, I think things will come more to the surface being in it, you know, being the election is going to be taking place then. Uh, I just think we're going to have a lot more indicators and a lot more indication of consumer confidence and industry confidence mm -hmm. that, that it'll be a clearer picture as to whether you know, what kind of dip, if any, there's going to be, or we're just going to continue to stay in this, in this lull, uh, you know, like the U shaped curve, um, as opposed to, I mean, I don't think we're in a V shaped curve at this point, but you know, how long we're in that bottom part of the U makes sense. Yep. I see this as kind of being yeah. like a foggy day, you know, when the weather's very foggy, you, you don't necessarily stay at home all day long. You still go places, you still do stuff, but you drive a little bit more carefully. I see, you know, kind of real yeah, estate right. being a bit like that, where, you might go from 10 deals a month to five deals a month or, or, or whatever, but you're not you're not doing nothing. You're still doing deals. You're still proceeding cautiously. You're not going to just hunker down in your bunker. It's not it's not Armageddon here. It's just an uncertain time. And I, I agree with you that the fog will, will probably clear quite a bit by, I mean, by January. Listen, that's that's what will lend itself to a, a more of a downturn. If people take that mindset of if it's a foggy day, I'm going to stay inside. And, and not go outside. So, you know, I encourage everyone out there, I'm sure you do too, is keep on doing what you're doing. And, uh, you know, just be a little bit, we just don't know when. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. No, I, I agree. You should you should keep on doing what you're doing. You shouldn't stop things. You should, you should keep going. It doesn't have to be the exact same thing as you've done all along, but you should always stay active. You should always be looking at how to make your money work harder, how to increase your wealth, how to increase your passive income streams. I think that's as important now as, as it ever has been. I mean, can you can you talk to us a little bit about your own, you know, your, your job, your day job is is lending short term money to people, you know, and, and getting that interest rate and helping them become successful flippers and wholesalers. Do you also, you know, spend some of that, the profits from that on, on passive investing? Do you have, you know, rentals or stocks or, or other types of loans that you, um, you do passively? Well, yeah, just to differentiate Equity Max, <clears throat> you know, the, our main company, uh, that's essentially my father's net worth. It's his money. That's what we do day to day. I have my own little personal stash, if you will. Okay. Back during the Great Recession, I bought and rented out, um, at, you know, at a deep discount in 2008 to 2010, 11. I bought six REOs, held them as rentals, sold them when the market rebounded, and have since used that money to, to uh, finance real estate investors just on a lot smaller scale than my father and Equity Max. So. Uh, my wife and I, it's our nest egg, and, and we lend to real estate investors just like Equity Max does, just on a lot smaller scale. So we, we hold about 10 mortgages, um, but, you know, it's, it's not passive. It's definitely like in and out, in and out, because they're hard money loans. And as soon as we, uh, as soon as we get one payoff, we want to try and push that, those, those funds back out again. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. I, I love that you did that with uh, the Oreos and cashed out and then used the profits from that to do something that you're already very good at. That, that's, that's awesome. That makes yeah, a lot of sense. It, it gives you another hat to, uh, to learn from, you yeah. know, I, I can look at, at loans that we do with an investment lens, with an investor lens, because I was an investor, um, at one point. It's a good skill set to have for sure. Yeah, and it's it's something I've I've looked at as well, and I've done. I've I've borrowed a lot of money short term, and I've also started lending money short term because it's, like I said, I like learning the different the different ideas. I like doing wholesaling, flipping, you know, loan notes. Which do you like more? Feet to the fire. Which do you like more? I don't know. I mean, the flipping was like the day job, and then the the passive lending was was more like the that was passive. That was like extra income, you know, yeah. like it is for the rental houses. Yeah, you know, I. I I like them all. I like I like doing a variety of things. To be honest with you, I like learning and and trying new things in, in real estate. It's, real my estate is so rewarding has, that way. Uh, my father goes by a line, very obvious. I was one of my uh, rentals that I ended up selling. I was only making five thousand dollars on it, and he said, "Greg, you can never say no to a profit." So whether it's passive investing, it's active investing, it's flipping, it's being a landlord, it's lending. If you're if you're in the black. That's a good thing, right? It is. And I, I know plenty of, of wholesalers that, that lost money on their first few deals, sometimes a lot of money, but they wouldn't, if you gave them the choice, they wouldn't rewind the clock because of what they learned doing it and, and how they use that Absolutely. knowledge to make supersized profits on the next five deals. I mean, I, you know, I remember basically breaking Absolutely. even on the first few deals, earning a couple of thousand dollars after months of work and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it was a real pain, but it, it didn't you know, didn't stop after we, we just learned the lessons and applied them and, and kept going. Absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't have said it better myself. So what, what advice might you have, Greg, for newer investors that are thinking about doing their first deals and, and are kind of nervous about approaching lenders to do it? I mean, do they find mm -hmm. the deal first? Do they find the lender first? What, what's, what's the best way to do this? I say there's no wrong way to do it. And, you know, listen, you can be in a position where you have all the expertise in the world, but you have no money. And then you have someone like us, or, you know, you want to be in real estate, but you want to definitely be more passive Then you find someone that has that expertise and, and you finance them passively, um, you know, maybe as a, under a JV joint venture agreement, something like that. Um, you know, knowledge is power and knowledge is free and information is free. So partner with people that, you know, aren't going to charge you an arm and a leg for it. Um, you know, I recommend if you can sign up for any any cost effective mentorships, your local real estate investment communities, which is where we met. Mm -hmm. You know, these are are these are sound uh, um, results oriented approaches that you can take. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't travel to California for a three week, a three day seminar that costs twenty thousand no. um, dollars. Not having done your first deal. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, there's no wrong way to do it. Um, I think partnering either you know, on deals or just for information with someone like yourself, for instance, mm 
uh, if you're in the Tampa area or Alabama or Ohio, I mean, you know, yeah. the insight you can give them is probably invaluable. And then on that deal that they were going to make only a couple thousand dollars on, they'll now be more profitable because they can learn from someone like you and avoid, uh, you know, some of the pitfalls you did uh, on your first couple of deals. Yeah. No, I mean, making mistakes is all well and good, but if you can learn from other people's mistakes instead, all the better, <laughs> you know? Try to, well, try not, listen, I've made my fair share too. Oh, I mean, don't even get me started, but it's uh, your ability not to repeat them. Yeah. You know, uh, and that's really what separates the, 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 the average investor from the really great investor. And I'm um, learning from your mistakes. It is, and, and just and, taking know, action. I, I find that a lot of, people that that struggle to get started is it's because they spend too much time in front of a computer screen and not enough time actually networking with people and in the field not enough time looking at houses not enough time being in a room with other people that are buying houses i mean colin you know me i never say no to networking you know yeah. um uh put, put yourself out there you know you will find like-minded individuals that think like you that may be a little bit apprehensive like you or, or may want to get the ball rolling and you use them as inspiration so that you can do the same. Uh, you know, but listen, the, the, t the time is not in the future. The time is always now. And if you, you know, you never want to, uh, you never want to look back and say, man, I should have started this because that's what I did. You want to uh, umbrella mistake that I made. I did my first flip, uh, you know, maybe in like, 2009 and uh you know i could have done it a year before right and i could have probably bought that i bought six properties if i knew what i knew now and learned from the mistakes that i made then i probably could have got double or triple the amount of properties so um you know it's all about being able to take advantage of uh, you know what information and experience you have now and uh if you don't have it to try and get it and you know, move forward. Yeah, move I, I forward. agree. I mean, I think people regret not taking action far more than they regret taking action. I mean, it's it's generally much better to, to do stuff, learn from it, keep going, get bigger, improve than just to be constantly wondering, should I do it? Should I do it? Should I do it? You're, you're far more likely to regret not doing something than you are to, to do something. So, you know, what's, you know, just kind of winding things up, Greg, what is the best way for somebody to meet uh, lenders like you and, and other investors where they can maybe do joint ventures with, how do they find them? You know, I mean, I, I, what, what's your advice for them getting started? Cause it could be anywhere in the country listening to this. Sure. Um, so first off, welcome to the exciting world of real estate investing. Um, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, you're watching us, uh, you're now in the game. So congratulations. Uh, number two, you know, there are so many meetup.com or each, or, or I say this, each major metro market uh, around the country has their own real estate investment community. In fact, some markets have three. Tampa has three separate real estate investment uh, associations that you can go to monthly. Um, and different people go to each of them. And if you set time to go to these after hours, and there's no excuse to conflict with your job unless you work at night, but you know most of these meetings are after hours, you can go to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to the extent that you can't get out of your house, I mean, look at what we're doing, you know, we're, we're network. This is not, this is networking. Yeah. You know, I'm talking with Colin and, um, you know, someone who's listening to this may get a deal off of Colin or, or may, uh, sell something to Colin and may get financing for me. It's putting yourself out there as much as you can whether it's in person, which may be a little bit hard right now, but, you know, digital meetup.com. I mean, the, the, with the internet being um, just so wide ranging and widespread, there are several opportunities and new sites and new ways to, to network and, and mingle uh, and, and meet potential partners whether you're working with them on a deal, they're financing your deal, uh, or you're buying a property from them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's just the opportunities are endless and the resources are endless. So just find them. You're right. And, and I'm going to put a few links and like, like meetup.com saying you're available and, and uh, even Facebook. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, uh, Dustin, I'll plug Dustin right now, Dustin Griffin, who runs the Tampa Ria meeting. Mm -hmm. I think he has the largest 
Facebook group for Florida investors. It has like 10,000 or something members. It's a, a Florida, um, you know, Florida real estate investor group or something like that. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, Dustin's great. I, and those are the types yeah. of groups that people should be getting involved in. And, and there's groups like it all over the country with Facebook, with, you know, in big websites like biggerpockets.com. There's, there's no shortage of ways for you to network, you know, in person, ideally, or if not, you know, at least virtually with, with, with people. But look, you peeps, a lot of people listening to this might want to get in touch with you as, as well, Greg. You lend all over Florida. I know you lend in other places as well. How do, what's the best way to people to, to contact you? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, uh, a deal is a deal by any other name. So I'll, you know, my personal cell phone, 954-663-5410. Uh, you can go to our website, equitymax.com. If you fill out any contact form on there, they all go directly to me. Uh, my email, Gregory, G-R-E-G-O-R-Y, M-R-E-M-M-E-R, -E -M -M -E at equitymax.com. And uh, I think... Going back to how do you get involved in this business, this is a 24-7, 365 business. If you call me over the weekend, I'll do my best to answer. If you call me after hours, I'll do my best to answer. And, you know, those are times that deals can occur. Um, yep. You know, I'm sure, Colin, you've had a situation where, you know, you maybe a buyer fell through and you had the opportunity to pick up this property. I mean, that usually doesn't happen during the nine to five hour. It usually happens when people are scrambling at night before they're going to bed and yep. it's opportunities to take advantage of. You're absolutely right. We've had plenty of deals at nine o'clock at night. And if I hadn't jumped on them, somebody else would have taken them at 9.30 or, or the next morning. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Exactly, exactly. And I gotta say to you, Colin, thanks for having me. Um, really appreciate the opportunity and uh, the opportunity to work with anyone that's watching or listening to this. So. You're very uh, feel welcome. Feel free to reach out. It's been a lot of fun, Greg. I, I really enjoy it and, and hope to uh, see you soon in Tampa, okay? Yeah, hope to see you soon. We'll see what happens, right? <laughs> we'll see what happens. All right, you take care. Exactly. Take care. Be well. Bye-bye. There you have it, folks. That was Greg Emmer of Equity Max talking to us in Colin Podcast about real estate show number five. I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly did. I love bringing on these guests and finding out what they have to say about this industry. I always learn something I wasn't expecting and I always, the conversations often take ways that I, I didn't necessarily know about, but I was glad that they did. So thanks as always for your support. If, if you really like these shows, please do give us a rating or a review or even better share us among your friends and families and colleagues that you think might enjoy this type of show. I also have a number of new resources on my website, colininvestments.com. You can also find it via colinpodcast.com where I've written a number of real estate reports, which are free to download, that talk about my tips on investing in the COVID economy, the four types of investors and how you can progress from one stage to another, the five different types of questions you should be asking as an investor in terms of what due diligence to do, how to vet property managers and many more things. You'll find other videos in there, links to old podcasts, webinars, whole lot of different things. I also have a Facebook group, Colin Investments. You'll find me on Instagram and Twitter if you want to look at the show notes. So yeah, just try and stay in touch. Let me know if there's any way I can help you accelerate that real estate journey. I'd be very happy to do it. Uh, but for now, this is uh, Colin Murphy signing out and I uh, look forward to speaking to you again with show number six. Bye-bye. Take care.